Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Simulation Step Up Series. My name is Brian Zayas. Today we're going to talk about correlating simulation with test results. Now the goals today are to understand what assumptions we make in CAD can really impact the test results, as well as how do we get results out from simulation that correlate to the type of results we get from our sensor and data acquisition on the physical test, and maybe how do we use simulation to help guide how to set up that physical test in the first place, and then explore in CAD some of the sensitivity of these assumptions, how to pull out these results, and we'll also talk to about a couple case studies of correlating physical test and uh, simulation. When we examine the process of physical testing, I look at it and it's very, very similar to that of simulation, whether it's FEA or CFD. You know, we always start with the input. The input is either going to be the physical prototype or the CAD model, and it's going to be somehow prepared for the test. In the CAD world, of course, that means simplifying the geometry. In the real world, that means creating the fixturing that's going to uh, restrain. We'll see even in that first step, we're already making assumptions. If I am not analyzing the exact geometry that's the prototype, well, is my result going to be valid? So how much of an assumption is that? And then how am I restraining it fixture-wise, and how am I going to represent that in the simulation, which gets us into pre-processing. Okay, that's setting up the boundary conditions in the CAD model. How is this thing held and restrained? And that's also the test setup. So are we really matching those if we want the results to match up? We get to solving or executing the test, right? Subjecting our geometry or our prototype to the physical phenomenon or solving in the CPU the governing equations that show what the response of this geometry is going to be. And then finally, post-processing or test evaluation, taking in all the data, analyzing it, creating charts, graphs, outputs, and then reporting it. So similar processes, and again, every step along the way, we have to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples. Again, if you're not familiar with the FEA process, if you're more on the test side, this is pretty important to understand that the CAD geometry, we all know, is sometimes not what comes off the shop floor, as well as it's not always what goes into the simulation. We take the simplified geometry, we go into the mathematical model, and really it's this middle where there's a lot of assumptions made, right? Are my material properties what's coming off the shop floor? Am I fixturing it the same way that the test fixture is holding it? Is my loading the same? Or am I applying a, a force or a pressure that's too idealized? Are contacts and frictions taken into account properly? And on and on and on and on. So sure, FEA gets us good results, but when we start to look at are they not matching up in the test versus the simulation, I like to go back to the beginning of the process and see what assumptions have we made. So let's get into our first example in SOLIDWORKS and see just how those assumptions change the results. So what we're going to look at is actually an example from the simulation training book. And again, if you haven't taken the simulation training course at your local reseller, you got to do it because you're going to learn all about how to set this thing up and actually use this as a case study. But I want to use it as one example in restraints. We see this uh, garbage container. Uh, and we're testing for the mounting lug here, or the hauling lug, which is basically just a, a bent piece of bar. And we want to understand what's the factor of safety on this, and of course, test for it. So take a look at the geometry on the bottom left that shows uh, the two mounting plates. So everything's made out of 304 steel in this example. It's welded with double-sided fillet welds. And the worst case loading is 3,000 newtons inclined at 15 degrees. This is all about understanding how the fixtures and connectors can influence the results. So let's go to SOLIDWORKS and see a couple iterations of changing the fixtures and the connectors. In the first version, I just have the single part geometry. So for example, if you're using a simulation express where it only lets you do one part, this might be how you're analyzing it. To represent the fact that it's welded to those two side plates, I have fixed these two split lines. So as we know, a fixture is infinitely rigid. There's absolutely no translation of the nodes on that surface. And then of course I have my force set up per the test requirements at 15 degrees. And I just used a little sketch line to be able to select that vector versus you know breaking it down into components. All right, let's take a look at the displacement. Is it going the right direction? 15 degrees, looks good. So my max stress shows right in the middle, right? Uh, makes sense, and it's 2584. Write that one down. 
Now, if I'm thinking about doing the digital prototype and then correlating that to physical, one thing, and we'll come back to this later, but I want to show you real quick that we can plot the first principle, the tensile stress, as well as plot it in arrows. So if I was looking for a good place to apply a strain gauge, well, I can align it with the area uh, as well as the direction of principal stress to try and find a good location. So I know the orientation and the location for a strain gauge. Okay, so 2584, but let's go a layer out. And the first thing you wanna to do to check your assumptions of fixturing to me is go out in the assembly. In the real world, no single part really stands alone. So in this case, the bar is safety critical. Let's zoom out a level of components and let's actually include the plates, all right? Plates are gonna be flexible. They're made out of the same material with the bar. And instead of fixing those split lines, I'll just fix the plates where they're gonna be welded to this assumed infinitely rigid trash container. Looking at the displacement, okay, it's a little bit more, right? Because now we have the flexibility of the plates, okay? So was it a good assumption to, you know, 100% rigidly fix the bar itself? No, I need to go out a level of components to get that flexibility of the system. And also the stress has moved. No longer is the hot spot right in the middle. That's gonna still be the same value. Ah, but we see that there's a huge amount of bending stress right on that plate, about 6,500 PSI, over double what we saw in the first one. Uh, what does that mean? Our factor of safety minimum is now 4.6. All right, so we're getting closer. We thought we were way over designed. Well, here, maybe I need to beef up the plates. But again, let's go one more level of realism, and let's represent the thin plates as shells. Representing them as shells allows me to better uh, represent their bending stiffness and stress and I'm also going to use the weld connector and now let's take a look at what the results see displacement is about the same but the stress is now ah, it's a little bit higher okay so now that I'm capturing the bending stress uh, more accurately we see that the answer is close to 7400 uh, PSI with a factor of safety of 4.1 Okay, so what does this mean to correlating with test? Well, first of all, understand how I'm doing the test. Obviously, I'm gonna clamp this part somewhere when I apply the load. So where am I clamping it and how flexible is the clamp? But this could also inform if I'm gonna go do the test later after this type of digital prototyping. Well, now I understand I don't just wanna test that bar itself. I wanna go out a level of components and actually probably weld a prototype with the plates and then clamp the plates. So where you're fixturing your part, both in physical testing uh, and in the computer, is going to play heavily into the types of results that you get and the overall accuracy. Let's move on to a different example where I already have the physical test set up with strain gauges, and the goal now is to just correlate the results and view what the difference is. So I have a three big assumptions. One we already talked about is the restraint. If we assume this test stand is rigid, then I have to deal with how the wing interacts with the bolt, the bolts, okay? So am I gonna fix the bolt holes? Am I gonna use a bolt connector? Let's investigate that assumption, as well as the force. Notice there's an actuator with the uh, plunger, and that's pretty much a straight up and down force. It's not following at all, so I gotta make sure I just uh, do it straight down. And then another assumption is, well, are these strain gauge locations, can I really pull out the results there? And how do I know I'm pulling out the results from the right place when I go to do the correlation. Okay, taking a look at the CAD model, there's a few things I did to prepare this for our correlation study. Uh, the first of all is create two split line features. The first one is just a circle on the tip indicating where the plunger for the force is going to actuate. Of course, creating that split line allows me to create the, the exact spot to represent where I'm going to put the force. The second split line is just some straight lines with a sketch point at each intersection with the same dimensions of where the strain gauges have already been placed. Now the split line takes that sketch and pretty much forces it into the face, so now I actually have different faces. Now when the mesher goes into SOLIDWORKS and actually starts drawing the surface mesh, of course it's gonna respect the edges first as the boundaries on which it's gonna draw the tetrahedrals, meaning that I'm going to guarantee that I have nodes at these points. So I'll be able to pull out exact strain quantities uh, at these points. So the first study 
I've fixed the bolt holes because I want to compare again based on our previous findings with the other two examples what the fixture looks like with a restraint versus bolt connectors. Have the force applied, looks realistic enough. Uh, one thing I do need to appreciate though is is this displacement too much? My uh, displacement is 0.44 inches. So if my results aren't quite lining up, I might need to rerun this using large displacement mode. And a quick tip here, under the properties of a linear static analysis, we can turn on large displacement, which I've done in this example. You don't usually want to turn that on uh, when you're first running a static study just because it can really increase solve time. But of course, what that's doing is incrementally solving the stiffness matrix as the load is applied stepwise. Okay, so if there's stress stiffening uh, going on, it'll show in that result. Here I can see the first principle stress as well as the direction. So again, if I hadn't done the strain gauges yet, I can see the orientation and placement. Okay, I have a strain plot, and then what I wanna do is pull out the results right where my strain gauges are. So let's go ahead and do a probe, and I can also do a list selected and go in here and select these points. Okay, I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but I update it and then I can copy and paste these out or save out right here to a CSV file. So real quick, let's look at the displacement, 0.442 inches. I also reran it with bolt connectors. All right, looking at these results, the displacement, 0.475. Okay, a little under 10% higher, which again we'd expect because we're adding in the flexibility now.